All right, next question for you, and this one I want to bake your, I want to bend your mind a little bit. I want to, I want to kind of ask you a little bit. So, talk to me about the podcast you did with Apex Ammo. Because they're now they're are they a sponsor or did they just sponsor that podcast? So, um, Nick Charney, uh, who's one of the founders of Apex Ammunition, for years has been listening to the podcast. And we've kind of been in back and forth and I've had several hunters over the years, whether it be Arizona auction tag holders that have bought the Goulds tags and Mexico hunters, different guys um, using the Apex ammunition. And I've seen what it can do and, um, you know, got a message from Nick and we basically been bouncing stuff back and forth. And the, the topic of, you know, Jay, we want to be involved in what you're doing came up. And so we kind of formed a relationship. And so Apex uh, Ammunition is p- sponsoring the podcast this spring. And I wanted to have Nick on the podcast. I encourage anyone out there listening that's listening to this, you'll love the Apex um, podcast. And uh, they have sent me out some ammo. Um, and then all this COVID-19 with our, our ranges shutting down, a bunch of stuff. I haven't actually got to go out and shoot it through my shotguns yet. So the only experience yeah, okay. that I have is with, you know, my hunters and different people using it. Uh, one of my good friends, Phil Kramer, Kramer Hunts, he's been using it for the last several years. Dallas Strait, uh, the Straits out of Pennsylvania, they've been using it for years. Um, and, and the 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 thing about it, Chris, that's so intriguing to me and what I've seen from the birds that I've been around that have been shot are guys are able to use 410 and 20 gauge shotguns and having better penetration, having a more dense pattern than you even would with the with a 12 gauge shotgun. Not that you can't use Apex with a 12 gauge because you can and we are this spring. Uh, but what it's allowing is older gentlemen to carry lighter guns, uh, women and children to be shooting a more dense pattern and be able to actually have a better pattern with a 410 than a kid could with a 12 gauge, not to mention they can hold up a 410 much better. And there's even a craze of grown men using 410s and shooting, you know, super slams, uh, royal slams, world slams with, you know, 410 uh, you know, smaller bore shotguns. Uh, it's, it's, I'm excited about this partnership. I'm excited about what Apex is doing. Um, you know, the boxes of ammo that I did get of, of shotgun shells, you know, they're all initialed. Uh, they hand load everything. It's a a three person founder, three founders. They're all have military ties. Um, two of which are in the military, one of which is married to a, I believe a Navy fighter pilot. Um, so the, the story is just awesome. It's a, it's an American made, you know, story. They've had unbelievable success, um, almost to the point where, you know, it's, it's production is a problem for them. They have so much demand that the, you know, they're, they're hand loading everything. They're not uh, shipping stuff overseas to have anything done. They're doing everything themselves, but they run into what a lot of companies that, you know, start small run into. And that's growing pains of having so much demand and having a product that's so good that it's hard for them to keep, you know, keep it going. Uh, Their factory now is, you know, running just full time. They have full staff that's just um, hand loading all of these uh, loads. And, you know, I'm excited to see the performance. I already know from, you know, Phil Kramer's been shooting it for years and Dallas Strait's been shooting it for years. Uh, what it can do. Scott Ellis, uh, he's came down and hunted Goulds. He's, you know, a notorious, uh, stage caller and unbelievable turkey hunter lives in Florida. He's been, he's actually their pro staff manager. Uh, he's been using it for years. So it's, it's an exciting deal. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, congratulations. I think it's a, a, I did, I looked at the company and I, I'm pretty darn impressed with what they're doing. And I do like the fact that it's American made and I got a chance, well, not a chance. I've had a chance sitting in my safe for how many years, I, a year. So I had a couple boxes of tungsten from a different manufacturer that I just never used. I just never played with them. And I just, for some reason, 
decided, I'm like, you know what, I need to, I, I just want to play with, let me just run this through the shotgun this year, use it for turkey season, and just see it. There's a, it, that is the thing that is hard for me to wrap my head around, is the idea that I can use seven shot or nine, nine shot. shot. And I yeah. think, yeah, I, I think in, in Apex, they came up with that eight and a half shot. You know, I can use nine shot and have, just as much, if not more, penetration energy than I can with a size six shot. Five shot, actually. And it, it's actually more penetration. Um, and so you can actually have more shot pellets, if you will, in a pattern at 40 yards than you could with number fives because you've got way more pellets. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then, but t- tungsten but- is super, super di- uh, heavy. So you've got small, but you've got super heavy. So you're carrying that um, energy downrange. It's it's deadly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, no, no bones about it. Let's just be let's just be perfectly honest right up front. Fifty bucks for five rounds. That ain't just couch cushion change. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> mm-hmm. They're not, and it, it doesn't matter if you're talking Apex. I went through and I looked because people have asked me repeatedly, and I have re- I haven't done it yet because listen, I any anytime I'm testing stuff, ninety percent of the time it's, it's coming out of my pocket. So when somebody asks me, "Hey, have you tried this shot? Have you tried that shot?" No, I'm not going to go drop five hundred dollars on ten different boxes of, of tungsten ammo. It, it, sorry, it, or or whatever, you know, I, it's expensive. It's expensive. And so there's some people that look at it and you're like, there ain't no way in hell that I'm going to use that. However, there is the other side of that equation that if you're going to go on a a, a destination type hunt, or I would argue if you are that type of person that hunts Mississippi or Alabama or Pennsylvania or wherever you think your birds are the hardest birds to ever kill, and people are sitting there talking. How many times, Jay, do you have people show up in for a ghoul's turkey hunt and they go, I've got a 70 yard gun? Yeah. There's I mean, so many, yeah. Th- there's so many people that, that have in some of these places where turkey hunting is difficult, they have turned to high performance shotguns that shoot 60, 70, 80 yards because they need to take a shot that far. That's just the reality of it. Otherwise, you wouldn't kill a bird except maybe once every five years. So if if you're in that situation, this is where all of a sudden $10 or $12 a round, well, okay, you just spent how much money on a hunt? Okay, you waited 360 days since your last turkey hunt. You've waited 360 days for this next turkey moment. Is $10 really going to make or break it? Yeah, and I mean, most people are only shooting one or two or maybe three turkeys a year, and most people are going to shoot one or two or three or four times a year. You might as well shoot a denser pattern. You get more pellets in that pattern. I mean, the whole game is make it count. You know, you're not shooting 30 shots. It's not like a dove hunt where you're out there shooting, you know, hundreds of shots. You're only going to shoot... You may shoot five shots a season, period. Some guys only shoot yeah, once I, or twice. I know, I know for a fact I've had turkey loads. I still I have boxes of turkey loads in my safe that right are now. twenty years old. Yes, because, because <laughs> you know, if if I'm only shooting two birds a year because of just where I live in my you know, back when I was in college, I wasn't traveling. I had I literally got to hunt Colorado. That it. So I would either go I would if I got to hunt public ground in Colorado, over-the-counter units, it's one bird. And if you're lucky to draw a limited license, good for you, because now you get to shoot a second bird. Well, goodness gracious, if you're in a state that only allows you to shoot two birds a year anyway, well, that box of... Uh, now, obviously, obviously, you need to pattern your shotgun. I want to talk about that here in a second. I, I understand the caveat or the qualification you just gave me. However, I want to still talk to you a little bit about patterning the shotgun. Obviously, you're going to have to have the initial investment to get get some ammo, and you're going to need to pattern your shotguns. So you're going to take a, a few shots. You're probably going to use a box, at least a box of ammo 
the pattern you're shopping. I understand that. Now that gets, you're talking 50 bucks to 60 bucks a pattern of shotgun, regardless of whether you're using Apex or some other brand. I, I do like what Apex is about. Um, so you've got that initial cost. But then once you get it figured out, if you're only shooting one to two birds a year, well, now the cost of that box can be spread out across the two or three years that you, you're going to have that box of ammo. And the fact that now, Maybe that is the, the factor that allows you to perform better on the landscape. Maybe you can kill a bird a little bit more effectively and efficiently now. It's just, for me, it's been, and I, I, I have to believe this is the same for a lot of other seasoned turkey hunters that are maybe in our age class because I, you just grow up fours, fives, sixes. That's what you use. Fours, fives, or sixes. That's a turkey load. One, one or a mix or whatever, you get fours, fives, and sixes. And seven, eight, nine shots, that's dove hunting, that's quail hunting. You don't use that for turkey. This is a completely different mindset shift away from what things used to be. And, and last year, like I said, last was it? Not last year. Year before, was it? No, year before that. I finally pulled that box of tungsten out of my safe and shot it. Had a great pattern. Oh, my word. I mean, that bird was, the bird I killed was at 40 yards, and it acted like he was standing at 15. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, it just annihilated him. I was like, oh, my word. And so I do, I, I sit and I listen to this now, and, I, and I'm, I'm watching what these, these folks are doing, and I'm thinking, you know, I I'm going to be the first to admit, I kind of poo-pooed this whole thing for years. Like, why in the world do you spend that much? Yeah, you don't, eh, you don't need it. But the more time I spend around a variety of hunters, yeah, I, I think I'm leaning kind of the direction you're thinking. And, and for that very reason of what you said about the kids and about the lady. Because if you're, now, you and I have the luxury of hunting birds that are not as educated as other people. And you and I have the luxury of having our birds work our setups. 10, 20, a 30 yard shot out here. Why? It's a, that's a stretch. You know what I mean? Most of the time, most of our hunters don't need to take a 30 yard shot. Right. Because I, I, most of the time I'm putting them in 20 rough. And, and I'm talking just shotgun right now. Archery's even closer. Every now and then, if, you, if it gets late season and you need to stretch out to a 40-yard shot, okay. But when you sit down and you're taking a lot of, of ladies, a lot of first-time hunters, a lot of kids, man, I cannot tell you the number of times where a parent will ask me, well, my son, my daughter, doesn't like to shoot the 12-gauge or can't. Um, I used to cringe when they'd ask me for the 20. I'd be like, oh, man, are you sure you can't yes. shoot a 12? No, he really wants yes. to shoot a 20. I'm like, ah, oh. now I'm going to be like, okay. yeah, shoot the 20. Yeah, exactly. Okay, there you go. And when somebody said they're going to bring a 20 gauge, in my mind, what I just did, I, uh, of course, I'm going to say absolutely. Constantly. You limited your I can work opportunity. It, it's going to limit your opportunity. So what that immediately did is that now I am pigeonholing you and your hunt into certain properties and certain bird populations where I know, okay, these areas, I, I have a higher per, I have a higher probability of working a, a group of birds that I can put in front of this ground line at short range. Right. Versus other places where, oh my gosh, would it be an incredible experience for them to listen to 20 different gobblers on the limb and 110 on the limb just going nuts, but knowing full well those birds are probably going to pass at 35, 40 yards. And the dad tells me they, they are comfortable 15 to 20. So it limits where I can put them, and it, it makes me consider my hunt and strategy for that, that particular group a little bit more carefully. Now, oh my gosh, 
the, the ability to open up a different level of opportunity for folks just because the performance allows it. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm not going to entertain the, 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 the typical critics that say, oh, well, you're just using technology to make everything here. You just need to have woodsmanship and you need yeah, shut up. You know? It, yeah. That argument. We're all you. Yeah. I want to use, we're, we're, whether we're it's fishing or hunting, I want to use the best technology that I can possibly use. I want to be the most yeah. efficient with my kill as I possibly can. If I can kill something quicker, faster, uh, easier, hard, you know, like more impact, that's what I want. I want to be able to kill something as Absolutely. fast and as ethically as I can. You know, Absolutely. the whole thing about it is it's allowed people to extend their range. No different than it's allowed people that shoot a scoped rifle to extend their range. Then the whole argument of, well, how far should you shoot a scoped rifle? Well, you know, 50 years ago, they, they, you know, out past 100 yards with a rifle, you know, with iron sights was a big deal. Then scoped rifles came, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, let's not, uh, for me, I want to shoot the most efficient, effective killing thing that I can, weapon that I can. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, I'm excited about it. I, you know, when all this kind of started, COVID-19 wasn't even on the radar. And then all of a sudden I get the ammo. Then all of a sudden, you know, the public ranges are closed and, you know, they're, they're saying stay at home. And I'm like, well, dang, I want to get up there and, you know, shoot the shotgun and shoot this stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm anxious for this season, you know, where I can finally get and do all this and see a bunch of turkeys and actually see it you know if that's all i'm taking to mexico so all my ammo will be apex ammunition so after this season if all goes well even if half my season gets you know cut down from 75 to half of that birds i'll be able to report back and probably have some photos of you know here's a bird at 18 yards here's his head here's a bird at you know 27 yards here's his head and be able to show okay. people what this stuff can do. Okay, now, okay, you just you just started going into the next question I had for you, um, and I've got I've got actually I've got three questions for you, but I'm going to take them one at a time. Two of them relate directly to this the Apex ammo, and then the third one is going to be kind of somewhat related. Um, did in your conversations, okay, so different shotgun ammunition performs better or worse based on the choke that you use on your shotgun. There are some chokes that are considered wad stripping chokes. There's some chokes that are not wad stripping chokes. In your conversation with the guys, did they ever talk about what type of choke works best for this ammunition? If I remember right, he was talking about a 550 between a 550 and a, and a 660 choke uh, choke is what he said and I, he did mention wad stripping and non wad stripping and I don't remember what he said about that he was in that portion of the podcast it was getting pretty technical and it, it you know it kind of blew over me um but I've bought a series a couple of different chokes that I'm going to be trying and I should in another couple of weeks have actually what is working best for me so I'll be able to report back awesome Awesome. Because I, I'm, I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the biggest thing I'm worried about with this is it literally blowing their heads completely off and, you know, just absolutely destroying the head and, you know, having photos where the, it's just, I mean, the old term yeah. jelly head. That's what I'm yeah. worried about because I, and I told Nick, well, I said, you know, my shots are normally 20 to 25 yards and he just started laughing. You know, like, okay, oh, yeah, you're well, going to blow those heads and, completely off. And that and that was going to segue into my next question. Now, before we do that, this, and the reason why I asked about the choke uh, constriction is because, again, what I what we, we were talking about just a minute ago as far as their cost, these are not cheap rounds. And you put a, wrong, a, a choke that's bad for these rounds on the end of your shotgun, and you're, you're screwing up your pattern because the choke is wrong, that becomes a, a costly mistake. Yeah, I don't think so you want to constrict it too much. I don't think you want to constrict I'm, it too much. And that's what I was thinking. I'm like, you could you theorize? And this is this is my ignorance speaking and just spitballing. But 
like we've seen in this, this is going to segue into that next question. Like we saw down in Mexico, people would come on a hunt and they have, I've got this super ultra magnum premium, super blanky blank and scope. Yeah. And you, and you, and we look at each other and you're like, um, here, let me unscrew that. And put let's, this put the yeah. let's put yeah, the modified. Yeah. Let's put the modified. Put the modified. Yeah. <laughs> Because so, you're going to yeah, shoot it at 20 yards. So, yes, the answer to your question is I asked Nick, I said, man, we don't shoot out at 40, 50, 60 yards. We just don't. And he says, well, shoot it and let me know what you think. But, I mean, yes, okay. I, I think we can shoot most of my – you've seen it. Most of the birds are shot at 20 to 25 yards. I think you'd be fine shooting just a regular modified choke. I think so, too. I, I'm I, obviously there's going to be people listening to this podcast that are just Cringy. flipping out right now, doing doing cartwheels and yelling in their their phone speakers because they already have played with this. And if you have, by all means, get on social media and let us know. Save us time, dang it! You know, yeah. but seriously, because I, I think so too. You could probably put a modified or just a straight full and do well. But my question to you is, and it, it went directly to that, is are you going to change your setups down in Mexico this season in response to the fact that at 15 to 20 yards, that pattern is going to be what? An inch and a half across? Yeah, it, it's all going to matter of how I shoot the shotguns beforehand and what I come up with as far as how far away I set my decoys. I don't really want it. I would rather change my choke than change how far I set up from the birds and the decoys because I like from a video standpoint, I like how close we get to them. So Agreed. maybe if I have to set them 10 yards out further, that's one thing. Uh, but I would rather change the shotgun choke and i'm I'm basically gonna have to just shoot it and see what it does at 20 yards 30 yards and 40 yards and see you know count pellets in in the um pie plate if you will and see in the kill zone what i've got and i won't know until i shoot it yeah is my the only thing that when i was listening to the you guys talk. The only thing that, that struck me now, when people are going down and hunting ghouls with you, by and large, now there are, there absolutely are exceptions. There absolutely are. But by and large, a lot of your hunters are experienced hunters. They've killed a bunch of birds and they're working on their world slam or whatever. And so th this is a, they've been there, done that. They've killed some birds. Now there, there's a whole gamut of, technical ability and and shooting ability through that whole thing but most of by and large i think a lot of your guys are, are guys and gals are are success have been successful somewhere else in the past my my question was those and and i was down there with you some like well the guy that, that shot the decoy with a bow there's some folks that just get i get my heart's pounding i get riled up and and some people get that you know gobbler fever or whatever and Man, if that pattern is that tight in those close ranges, what birds are going to get missed? And then the other thing I thought, and this is not this, and this is just a general thought. The other thing that popped in my head was, how much more careful do we need to do we need to be now? Now we always need to be careful on what is downrange back behind our target. Goodness gracious, in a situation like you, where you've got so many birds, I mean, there's been plenty of times where we've set up on those ghouls, and you've got, what, 20 birds yeah. around? Yeah, you're going to have to definitely have make sure downrange behind where you're shooting is clearer yeah. than before, because you're going to be carrying yeah, it out and carrying penetration out further for sure. Yeah. That's going to be another caveat to that whole thing. It's like, wow, okay. That I mean, obviously, you need to be careful in general, but now you've got more lethality at extreme ranges, you know. So it's like, man, with everything comes a trade off, and so you start going, you start getting excited and giddy about, oh, this is going to be this and this. 
you got to kind of take a step back and say, okay, and then what? You know, what are what are the unintended consequences? What are the, the periphery things that don't necessarily hit our brain at that emotional moment where we go, wait a minute. That, so I am, I'm, I'm very, I, I'm, please let, well, obviously I think you're going to let everybody know, but by darn well, you please let me know. Cause I'm very curious to see how you, what your shotguns do with the chokes that you have and what those patterns look like at close range. Because I just wonder if, I kind of thought, my back of my head, I, I thought exactly what you kind of said. I, I said, I wonder if Jay's going to push that decoy spread out 10 yards just to have that little bit of a little bit of a, a larger pattern, a little bit of a buffer. But yeah, the last thing I want is guys shooting a golf ball pattern at, you know, 18 yards. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the people that want a full body mount. Now, granted, I know you can get freeze-dried heads and you can get fake heads and all that type of stuff for your turkey, but, but a lot of these guys want full body mount. Oh, I just pray they don't pull. <laughs> well, we saw that one year where the guys just accidentally either pull a little low or they just body shoot the face because, oh, you're, oh. Can you, imagine, can you imagine the body shots on this? <laughs> no, oh, my I gosh. Can't. You'll just blow. I mean, it will blow them to pieces. Well, and see, and it's kind of funny. I'm laughing because my brain circles back to what I asked or what we were talking about just a minute ago about these in so far as I have been in a situation with youth. I have been in the situation with new like ladies that were, were going to come out and have their first hunt. They get excited that maybe they accidentally pulled a little low and they shot a little low. Now for me with Rio's, most of the people that come out and hunt with me, they are not working on their slam. They're not looking for a full body mount. They just want to come out and shoot a turkey. And I've had times where, you know, they pull and they kind of hit him in the body. And I've seen a couple of, not a lot, but a couple of times where they hit him in the body and, you know, with a 20 gauge or whatever, it rolls the bird and the bird gets up, takes off and runs it. So for me, I like the idea. Again, it's just like, what did I say about mechanical broadhead turkeys? I want you to throw a gigantic mechanical broadhead through a turkey. Why? Because if you make a bad shot, the impact of that head is going to be significant in, in knocking that bird down, breaking that bird down, and causing massive trauma to where you have a high percentage play of recovering that bird. Well, with these new shell, with the, with the tungsten and, and with what, you know, with the apex, I, I know there's other people out there. I just really did like the veteran. I, I like everything about how the company was, was structured at the moment. So I love the fact that you're working with them. Um, I like the fact that, you know what, now if a kid does kind of shank a shot or if, if, a, if a new hunter kind of accidentally gets excited and shanks the shot, wow, it, it gives us an opportunity now to have a little bit more penetration through muscle and, and heavy feather. Bone. Yeah, smashing through yeah. feather and bone it, and actually killing. It, break, it breaks them down. You know what I mean? Even if they shank the shot and it doesn't kill the bird, but it broke his back and it's flopping, I can dive. I'll do my Superman dive out the front of the blind, and I'll go, I'll go pounce on the thing. But at least now it's not running. You know what I mean? Yeah, for so, sure. No, I'm, I'm very interested. And then the other question came up, and I think you touched on this at the beginning. Someone asked about, and I've had this, what shotgun? If you're going to buy a shotgun for turkey hunting or someone – Calls you, Jay Scott, that I'm, I want to come down. What shotgun? I, I, obviously, you have shotguns there for folks. But if, if someone said, what shotgun should I buy? What are you recommending? Let me answer that in just a second. Chris, we have a uh, question from a uh, Instagram follower, and uh, he wants us to call him. He's got a couple questions. He's talking about some Colorado uh, birds in Unit 44. Let's give him a call here real quick. I want to take a second here and thank the sponsors of the podcast. I want to thank GoHunt.com, my friend Cody Nelson, the glassing guru. He's the optics manager at GoHunt.com Gear Shop. If you have any optical needs at all, give Cody a call directly at 702-847-8747. You can also send him an email at optics at GoHunt.com. You can also text him at 602-399-3699. I want to thank 
Go Hunt for their sponsorship. Also remind you guys, we're in application season. The Go Hunt Insider is the best Western hunting resource tool out there. It's got the best draw odds and harvest statistics available. You can go to gohunt.com forward slash jscott. Just by signing up, you're going to get a $50 Go Hunt gear shop gift card. I want to thank gohunt.com. I also want to thank Kuyu. That's K-U-I-U. Uh, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting, Kuyu.com. Uh, Kuyu is the gear that I wear on all of my hunts. Phonescope.com, I want to thank them. Use the JScott20 promo code. You're going to get a 10% discount on all orders. On Xmaps.com, use the JScott20 promo code. You're going to get a 20% discount on all orders at Onyx Maps. And then Apex munition.com apex ammunition it's the home of the tss the tungsten super shot that is the shotgun shells that i'm going to be using on my upcoming turkey hunts go to apex munition.com to find out more guys let's get back to the episode sean i've got chris rowe on the line it sounds like you've got uh, some colorado turkeys you've got some questions about go ahead and give us the give us the lowdown I do. Thanks for taking my call, Jay. Uh, appreciate your help, um, you know, online and everything. Chris, how you doing? Doing all right. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, so I finally drew a 44 turkey license in Colorado. Uh, it takes about three to four years to get, so I'm pretty excited. Um, How's it going? I've been hunting turkeys for two years, so I'm not um, by any means a professional. Um Basically, I've been scouting for the last week, and I found two zones where I found birds in. Uh, what's the likelihood that they will be in those zones in two weeks? When does your season start? Two weeks. Okay, so around the, the fifth. Okay, the eleventh of April. Yep. I I would say. Much, go ahead, Chris. Oh no, sorry, I didn't mean to step on you. I, I was just going to say, how much snow did you see up there right now? So they're basically kind of at snow line. Um, and it's it's pretty spotty. I mean, they're not like that solid snow that's still just kind of drifted up up there. But um, they're definitely as high as they probably want to be. So I would tell you that I think those birds are probably going to be right there. I would keep an eye on the weather, obviously, over the next two weeks. If all of a sudden it gets really, really warm and that snow line, you know, starts sliding up. We had, Chris and I, we've been talking here for a couple hours uh, on podcast and one of the questions that did come up was snow line um, but I would say that I would kind of keep track of those birds but keep an also track on that snow line and if it starts obviously sliding up you know know that they're, they're probably going to be there or maybe even a touch higher if you feel like you know they're at as high you know pretty high elevation already I would I would bet that you've got those birds there one of the things I would encourage you to do is keep track of those birds but potentially if you have the ability to to keep scouting is reach out and just keep looking for other pockets of birds with it being a public, yeah. public land hunt you know how those can go at some time you could pull up to your two best spots and there's guys already camped or parked there you're going to have to have other birds that you can go Back after plan. chris what are your thoughts yeah so have you have you or do you know right now where those birds typically spend their winter um yeah honestly i don't think they're far from it um where okay, good. Good. where i found them there is a ton of sign you know scratches where they dig to feed and and um roosting areas and i mean it's it's pretty beat beat up with sign gotcha okay then the reason why i asked that is because have you have you turkey hunted in colorado before yeah, last year I killed a bird. Okay, because I was just going to say, it almost seems like clockwork every year that you are mm -hmm. going to hunt on opening weekend. You're going to hunt in the snow. Either you're in a snowstorm or three to five days prior to season, you get a just massive snow comes in and dumps on everything. So right. the reason why I ask that is because if there was a major difference in where they winter to where they are now, if just keep an eye on the weather because if all of a sudden here in the next couple of days or the beginning of April, all of a sudden there's a massive snowstorm, they could fall back to where they just came from. Well, but if, if 
if they are at that good screen green up right now, and there really is no more elevational gain for them to follow, say it stays warm, say it starts to melt off, and say that green up just starts marching itself up the mountain, up an elevation, as long as where they are now is kind of where they're going to be as that green up progresses, I have I, I like what Jay said, I, I think they're going to be right in that same neck of the woods. Gotcha. That is helpful. Any <laughs> other questions you've got, Sean, as far as turkey hunting? Um, yeah, it could be specific to this area, but um, what are the best weeks to hunt as far as responsiveness um, from, you know, mature toms to calling? Chris, I'll let you tackle it first. Me, for Colorado, I absolutely loved and I performed best that last part of April. I always would go out opening week. I would always go out opening weekend, absolutely, and I've killed birds opening weekend. However, there have been numerous times hunting from the north part of the state all the way to the southern part of the state and then over in the southwest part of the state. There... There, there are is a high level of likelihood that when the season opens, those birds might be locked down on hens. And so they'll gobble at you, but you need to be in the direction that those hens want to go, or you need to be able to call the entire flock to you. But later on at the end of April is when, generally speaking, I started to see those hens going off and laying eggs, and where the midday hunt, at towards the end of April are absolutely money as far as getting those birds to come just cruising on their own or doubles and just covering lots of ground to make their way to your calling. Understood. Sounds good. Uh, you kind of answered my other question. Um, last year I noticed a lot that it's, I don't, it kind of, I don't really like when people compare it to elk hunting, <laughs> but it, there are some similarities as far as like public land, mountain turkey hunting. Um, There's a hell of a lot of, of similarities. What do you mean you don't like that? Well, yeah, I mean, just the challenge aspect of it. But yeah, it's very similar. Um, yeah. So I was going to ask about being henned up. Sounds like that's definitely a thing. And, uh, you know, as far as like roaming toms and uh, that sort of thing. It, it depends on the number of birds that are in the area. Now, I this is many probably ten years ago. Now, I hunted four forty four, so I kind of know that I know generally where you are. Uh, yeah. It all depends on what that turkey population looks like these days. If it's if it's still a small kind of remnant, little pockets of birds, it, it, it can be tough. But if that population has expanded, <clears throat> and you've got a lot of two year old birds running in the landscape, you very well may get out there opening day and just have at the hunt and have a two year old run you over. But sure. just understand, if it's a small group of birds and they're a tight-knit group of birds and they've been with each other all year long, they might be a little cautious of other pen, or other turkey sounds. And just do, again, Jay said it, we've been talking for hours now, but we hit hard uh, earlier about scouting and just watching the pattern of those, the movement pattern of those birds. Where are they going? And can you get in front of where they already want to be? And Copy the other that. thing, other thing, Sean, is um, fight the urge to call to them with the calls that you're going to be using during the hunt. I mean, it's one thing to kind of be trying to figure out where they're roosting and shocking them, you know, with a coyote howler uh, or something like that to, you know, get them to shock. But if you've got birds that you're watching and you've kind of got dialed in, fight the urge to mess with them. Just watch them with your binos, listen with your ears, and, you know, that will create a situation where you have birds. Once you start calling to them, it's fresh and not, you know, you haven't worn it out two weeks prior, um, you know, calling to the birds. How long does the season last there? Oh, it's it's fairly long. I want to say it's 40 five days okay so you go well and in, you go into may then well into may yeah yeah into may yeah and and chris i've even been there when i get back from my goulds and get up there by may 15th you know um sean i live in the carbondale basalt area in the roaring fork valley starting about may 15th till september 1st so i'm there all summer and a bunch gotcha. of my buddies up there 
um, over in you know that part of of the valley they they say that that may hunting can be fantastic um, I don't know what your experience has been there in in that unit but you know keep in mind you know, a lot of my friends there that hunt, not 44, but other units, they say, you know, May 1st can be just absolutely great. No, you're absolutely right. My question gotcha. too, Sean, is how many, like, have you, how many gobblers, like, what are we talking? Is, is you know, you got a bunch of gobblers found? Um, yeah, so the first group I found, uh, I think, was six mature toms. Good. A few jakes and probably a dozen hens okay. that I saw. And I tried to keep my distance because I did not obviously want to bust them out of there. Yep. Um, and then the group I found today was much smaller, probably three toms and maybe ten hens. Okay, again, though, I mean, if you have the ability to, you know, scout and just keep finding different pockets of birds and, and, you know, trying to establish where you might have different pockets where people won't be, um, try and figure out where people are going to, if you're going to have company, where they're going to come in from and maybe where you can approach the birds. Or if you have a feeling of which direction those birds are going to move because of pressure, you might anticipate that. And, you know, whether it be get above them or around them, uh, you know, you might think of all that. I'm sure you already have. But don't take, if you've got birds pinned down and they're gobbling in the same place every day, keep in mind, anyone else scouting is going to probably be able to pinpoint those same birds. So, you know, try and, if you know, if you've public land elk hunted in Colorado, you probably already think like a ninja, but, you know, you've got to. Yeah, kind of, living in Eagle yeah. County, unfortunately, we're used to hunters over yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. That's okay, though. Seek those birds that, you know, might be out on the fringes uh, and, you know, maybe don't go after the most popular birds because you probably have company. Yeah, no, it's a fair uh, assumption. Absolutely. Um, that kind of leads me into uh, one, hopefully a quick one for you guys. Um, they gave out 50 licenses this year in this little zone. This kind of, I feel like is a lot. So just any tips on staying safe out there um, would be helpful. I don't know if you've had any situations that lend itself to that kind of advice, but yeah, I hopefully mean, not. <laughs> for, for, for me, I, I would just say, you know, if, if, if you're set up and it's before light or the night before and you've got birds roosted and all of a sudden a you know, truck rolls by and it's very obvious they're, they're going to go after the same birds, I would try and have a conversation and just say, hey, what's your plan? I, I mean, are you going in there? Yes, I'm going in there. Okay knowing ahead of time what you're dealing with is important and i always tell people on public land in arizona if you at any given time hear anyone else calling to the same turkeys you're working you need to either get out of there or if it gets close enough where they're calling and the birds gobbling and you're both calling to the same bird i've i've recommended people blow the entire deal over, yeah. over someone getting so close that potentially they're calling the birds gobbling, you're calling the birds gobbling, and you get a chance to get caught in a crossfire. It's better having a hunter upset with you that you blew his whole situation because you didn't want to get in a position where you're going to get any sort of crossfire. It's just not worth it. Um, but yeah, understood. Don't even mess with it. Yeah, don't even mess with it. Blow the whole thing and just go, look, man, I'm sorry, but I didn't want to have a situation where, you know, you didn't know I was here and, and, and you know, we nobody wants that. And, you know, that goes back to, you know, if you get a bird, you know, maybe have an orange ribbon, you know, there's a lot of things you can do to walk out of the woods safely. Chris, do you have anything to add? Well, I was just going to say, when he listens to this podcast, um, you know, we talked about just if you know you're going to be in an area with a lot of other hunters, just use caution if you want to decide to use a full strut decoy or even one of the newer, you know, DSD or Avian X, the real lifelike looking Jake decoys. If you're going to use a Jake or a strutter or something like that, just be careful with it and make sure your setup is such that you have a good something behind you and then you have good visibility around you if someone's going to be creeping through the woods. Most of the time now, you know, turkey hunting has been around long enough to where I think a lot of people are much safer than they used to be. However, 
you just don't know, and you still have idiots out there that just want to go stalk turkeys and just shoot at birds that they can see. So just be careful if you're going to use that, and I would absolutely not. Even though I love the guys at Heads Up Decoy, I love being able to do the you know the, the turkey fan and the reaper style hunts. Do yeah. not do that. Do not right. do that out there. Right. It, not in the mountains because it's inviting trouble. Poke, yeah, you always take somebody to hop over a ridge and just <clears throat> let loose. So just be careful on that. And, and like Jay said, if you've got mo- and we talked about again, we talked about this earlier, and I've got the, the YouTube video that shows it. But if you're in a situation where you have multiple birds gobbling now. Jay, I'm just I'm about to laugh at myself because now we're doing this on podcast, so now everybody's going to do this exact same thing. So we probably just shot ourselves in the foot. But <laughs> normally, if 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 I've got multiple birds gobbling, and you bird number one, say I've got three birds. Bird number one is next to the trailhead. Bird number two is is a, a half a quarter mile up the trailhead, and bird number three is a mile from the trailhead. I'm going to bird number three. Right. Because most people, as they're walking up, they hear a bird. They're going to go after now. Now, because we're talking about that, everybody's going to go to bird yeah, So pick three, bird two bird now. Psychology. So now yeah, now yeah. go to bird one. Yeah, yeah back <laughs> yeah, to bird that's one. Exactly it. That's exactly it. <laughs> or, I got you. And, I, and you joke, I mean, we joke about this, and I'm going to laugh about this, but don't discount letting everybody go chase the morning set. You know, everybody's going to go try to get on those birds and on the roost and try to call them off the roost, and they're, they're going to be all gung-ho. There's, I've done this in the past. It's, it's not a bad play to some time. <clears throat> just simply get yourself on the landscape and actually don't set, if you if it's just a bunch of people in the, the tra- at the trailhead in the parking lot, I have literally walked up the trail and literally stood on a ridge just in a location where I can hear and I don't even set up on a bird at daylight. I let everybody else set up. Everybody else start pushing and bumping birds. And then I just let all the initial fray settle down. And then from 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, that's when I go in. Once I hear where, what direction those birds are going to go, then I go away from the roost site, away from where everybody else was gathering. And then I just go out and I'll set out. And a lot of times you can you can beat the crowds that way as well. Remember, you can shoot, you can hunt all day. So, yeah, just that midday hunt. Yes, good point. Especially, especially, especially if some of the people that drew those fifty tags are locals, because a lot of people are going to go, you know, hunt in the morning, and then they've got other stuff that they've got to do the rest of the day. So they go hunt and then they leave, or they yeah. hunt and then they leave. Well, midday hours, afternoon hours can sometimes be really good. Gotcha. Sean, thanks for the question. Good luck. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, share pictures. Okay, we will do. Bye. All right, Chris. Um, you had asked me about the shotgun. Yeah, what if you had to recommend someone to if they if they said, Hey, I want to get into turkey hunting, what shotgun what type of type I don't care about brand, but what type of shotgun should I get? Twenty gauge, twelve gauge, four ten, uh pump semi-auto, long barrel, short barrel. What if, if Jay Scott was going to just go out and buy the gun for that person, what would you get? Well, up until this apex hole discussion, I would always tell someone a 12-gauge shotgun, usually, you know, a 26-inch barrel or more. Um, and I like semi-automatics because I feel like you can get three shots off quicker than you can with a pump. Um, I, I do love pumps, but I think a semi-auto, um, is probably best. I actually just bought a Stoger M3000, um, which is a kind of a cheaper version of a Benelli, uh, automatic. And I've heard lots of really good things about that. Um, you know, you say you don't want brand, you know, one of my favorite guns is that super black Eagle, you know, the, the, the Benelli black Eagle yeah. series. Um, you know, I've, I've used Dar's super black Eagle for years. Um, a bunch of birds have been shot with it. And I just love the fact that if for whatever reason they miss that first shot, I mean, they can literally just bam, bam. You've seen the old commercials where, um, three shots are gone before the first shell even hits the ground. Um, and I know that sounds crazy, but, uh, having the ability to 
shoot one, two, if you had to, uh, is, is to me better than a pump where, you know, you actually have to pump the shotgun to shoot the second shot. Um, so I would probably go with a semi auto. The, you know, what's crazy is the new trend is to go with the real short barreled shotguns. And I'm really not the guy to ask. I'm, you know, Dar's really the gun tinkerer and he loves tinkering with all sorts of guns. I'm more of a, just, you know, get me one good 12 gauge shotgun and I'm good to go. I don't even really need to mess with it. Um, but have you seen the whole, this whole thing with these real short barreled shotguns? It's a, it's a real trend right now. You mean, you mean like the shotgun I use? Is that what you're using? Is this real <laughs> short barreled shotgun? I, I actually bought that thing back in, uh, good gracious. It has to be now 89. I don't know. It's a Remington. It's yeah, it's a short barrel. I love my short barrel. I, it, as long as it, as long as the shotgun's going to pattern, the short barrel i prefer the short barrel but keep going because this this question is actually working out way better than i even expected so keep going keep going keep going on my shotgun yeah we, your opinion you just i mean my opinion always your, was when someone would say they wanted to use a 20 gauge for turkeys i just cringed because it it limited my range and i knew that my killing power was going to be way limited not that i was taking long shots anyway but now with the with this apex, I think it's gonna it's it's a game changer. Obviously, I haven't messed with it um, as much as a lot of other people. But I mean, they're shooting four tens and showing patterns of four tens at forty yards better than my pattern at twelve with a twelve gauge with five shot. Their their yeah. their their uh, numbers of pellets in the kill zone are three or four times more of my five shot. Crazy. With with the energy to kill him. with the That's energy the to kill him at that distance with a four ten, it's crazy. So much smaller shot, but heavier shot, if that makes sense. It's, so it's small. It's nine shot. You compare an, uh, you compare um, nine shot lead or nine shot copper with nine shot tungsten. The weight, I don't know what the difference is, but it's it's astronomical the difference in weight so you're carrying a much heavier more dense pattern out there at a, at a further distance what it's created though chris and it's kind of going off the subject of your shotguns but it's created the ability for guys to shoot 60 and 70 yards way more lethal than they could before at 30 or 40 but what it's caused is this whole grief of guys saying, oh, all these guys just want to shoot at 60 or 70. Not for me. That's not why it's intriguing to me. Why it's intriguing to me is if that I miss at 40 and the bird's out there at 60 and he's periscoping that I know I can outperform at 60 than a lot of guys were shooting at 35. Yeah, I, I, have have you have you articulated your position? I think so. Did you feel okay? Excellent, because <clears throat> folks that are listening to this right now need to understand something very, very important. We just stumbled upon probably the most monumental. I, I don't even know how to articulate this. We have actually stumbled upon. A topic that Jay and I disagree on. This is this is awesome because I am one hundred percent opposite of you on on my recommendation for a shotgun. Let's I didn't it. think that. I didn't think that. So this is awesome because you think about how many things that we. I mean, that was that's what I love when, when we get together and you have the uh, on pod, your podcast. But it, it ends up, and I get this feedback a lot that you know you and I think very much alike calling out you know uh, how we think about things and so this is actually funny are you I a single not... shot guy single shot no, you no, want to no. reload oh you're a pump guy you no. want to make the first shot count it, okay let's here's, here's <laughs> my i i actually chris have you seen me shoot <laughs> I, okay. I'd have a speed That's loader if I could. <laughs> I, I've, seen you, I've seen you shoot, but I've also seen a lot of other people shoot. And the funny part is, is 
the reason why I, I, I cannot stand auto, semi-automatics. I just load them. When I have a hunter show up at my place and they pull out a semi-auto, my first, and it doesn't even matter, even down hunting with you, they pull out a semi-automatic and I'm like, ah, crap. <laughs> because most of the time, in my experience, yeah, we get accustomed you know, to firing multiple rounds because we know we can. <laughs> well, no, that, that, okay, okay. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll touch on that one here in a minute because that that can be good, but I also think it can be bad. But let's touch on that. Or don't let me, don't let me get off on a tangent and not circle back to that because I, that's important. But no, my issue. Okay, I, I, let me. I guess I, I let me just say this: if you are going to buy. J stops shotgun and you're going to get a semi-automatic please please do me a favor please learn how to load that gun efficiently and quietly i can't tell you how many times someone shows up on a hunt and they're like all right let's should we load now and typically you know with a pump I can, we can actually go all the way to the ground blind or get, go all the way almost to the tree we're going to sit on and literally just gingerly drop a shell in the chamber and slowly close that slide and go and yeah. be done. I will agree Where with you. Is, a pump is way quieter and oh way gosh. easier to slide in something and then load the gun. Oh, I mean, my gosh. You, on I, these I Benelli's, you. too, you have to run the slide, and you I mean, it has to... I mean, you have to jack it. Yep. I mean, it has to really engage and close or else it is not going to fire. Bingo. Bingo. And that's the thing is, you know, some people think that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to slowly, I'm going to, I'm going to load the chamber and then I'm going to, I'm going to ride the slide down. Nope. She's not going to engage. And that bird's going to come in and you're going to put the, the safety off and the, the trigger's just going to be dead or it's just going to go click. Nothing. So you have to let that slide go. I can't tell you the number of people that show up with a semi-automatic and all I hear in the pitch black while we're trying to be quiet and the birds are on the roost, all your clicky clack, slack, slack, click, clack, scoop, click, clack, oh crap. I, I didn't put the, the round in the chamber for, oh wait, I can't put, oh, I got the gun jammed and now I've got to get the, fu- and, oh my word. I'm with oh, you. Oh my word. Hey, I ha- just, hang on just a second. We have another guy to call here, but give me just a second, okay? Chris, I've got Justin uh, on the line. He's got some questions about Eastern Colorado. Justin, how you doing? I'm doing well. Hanging in there. Let's hear your turkey questions. Yeah, so predominantly hunting Eastern Colorado, uh, probably uh, Parker, kind of just east of Denver. Um, been getting the birds on camera, and they're kind of all balled up. Um, looking, you know, for some decoy strategies, possibly for early season, that first two weeks. Uh, hunting out of a ground blind uh, with a bow. Archery. <laughs> We've been talking about that. We've been on podcast here for about almost four hours. And um, so you've got ground, uh, public ground, private ground. What are we looking at? Uh, private ground. I was okay. Able to obtain some- so private ground. So you have the ability to run a full strut or a Jake decoy and not worry about um, potentially someone, you know, shooting in your direction right correct chris i'll let you run with this and then i'll chime in yeah no and and by the way jay don't think you're gonna don't think you're gonna skate out on me on the finishing up this shotgun discussion (laughs) because we're we're in a gold we're in a golden moment here where i actually get to substantively debate you on something okay (laughs) i I won't forget Um, no, no so yeah We've been talking about this, and, and for your situation, early season, I absolutely would run the setup that we were talking about, a, a, what I call that whipping boy setup. I would, I, well, uh, before I get it, okay, let me take a step back. Do you have decoys now? Yes. What decoys do you have? Um, I've got a couple of hens from Avian. Uh, i got a lay down hen, some feeding hens. Uh, I also have uh, the one of the new Flexstone Jakes. Say that again. What, which Jake? <clears throat> Excuse me. The Flextone Jake. 
Oh, okay. All right, all right. Gotcha, gotcha. Do you have a full strut decoy right now? Uh, the only one I have is the, um, I believe it's the Primos one uh, that has the, the folding fan that you can actually, nice. uh, that has the shotgun nice. uh, groove for it. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So um, I would run them all. I, I would, I, early season, I would run them all. I'd have the strutter out there if, and then I'd have the Jake off, you know, I'd set the strutter where you want to take the shot. At whatever Mac, are you going to bow or shotgun? A uh, bow. Oh, oh, that's right. You said ground blind. Sorry. Yep, yep, yep. So, if you seriously, unless these birds are educated and spooky, I would literally set that strutter at like ten yards where you want to take the shot. Put the Jake decoy at like fifteen to seventeen yards off to you know behind the strutter and off to the side, and then I'd scatter your hens around and do some sweet call and make sure you're in in front of where the birds naturally want to go and then just take your time and make a great shot. Justin, awesome. I would, I would ask you the question of, so you've got some birds scouted out and do you know where they're roosting? Uh, yeah, they're about, um, so the prop, uh, the property that I'm hunting actually has about a hundred acres of undeveloped land, uh, about about 150 yards, um, up the ridge and they're roosting up in there. And they're kind of running a fence line every day um, to feed. I've been getting like 20, 30 birds every day on camera, but they're all kind of hanging together. Nothing's really separated yet. Okay, well, it sounds like if you've got them kind of pinpointed with a trail camera and you can kind of, between now and when the season starts, you can kind of get a sense of timing of what time of day are they crossing and what time of day are, are you getting pictures of them. If you can pinpoint and get a level of consistency where at nine o'clock, you know, almost every day they're, they're walking through this area. What I would do is that's where you want to set up your spread and maybe don't mess with them on the roost. Let them go ahead and have a little bit of sanctuary up there. So they stay on the property. Um, I yep. think, I think encountering them in a feeding situation is much better than up on a roost. Cause if you happen to bump them, you know, they could potentially go to somewhere else. So let them ha let that be their sanctuary and leave that be, don't even go up there is what I would recommend. And then Absolutely. I would set your spread. Now is your trail camera shooting down the line of the fence line? In other words, is the fence in the camera? Are they walking between the fence and the camera, or is it a down-the-line look that you've got? I have a, almost a perpendicular and down the line. I actually have the camera on the fence post. And, and which side of the fence are they on? Uh, on on the side um, that I, where I have permission to hunt, uh, where the camera is. So okay. they're coming in front of the camera. And the camera's pointed away from the fence. Okay, so in other words, you have a consistent pattern of which side of the fence that they like to travel, right? Yes. Okay, so you obviously want to set up your spread on the side of the fence that they're traveling on and, of course, the one you have permission to hunt on, right? Correct. And do you have a common direction that on camera you get them in the mornings, they're facing this way and lined out going left or right. And in the evenings, they're going back the other way. Or do you ha not have that much of a it, pattern? I would say it's been sporadic. I'm consistently getting pictures. Um, I've got, um, I'm going to have to pull the camera probably uh, four days before just because the new laws. But it's one of those cell phone cameras. Okay. Um, but they're, I mean, it's sporadic. They're like, I mean, midday, I'm getting pictures, morning, and, and then... Um, the last two days, I guess we got snow yesterday. I didn't get any pictures. When, when is the most consistent time that you're getting the photos? Uh, mid morning. Okay. So At I would nine thirty to. I would make sure if it were me and you really wanted to kill one and, you know, get one for sure. I would find the most consistent time. I would try and get in there before I wouldn't even try and call or mess with anything as far as trying to shock them or anything. Get in there, get all set up. Um, Chris, let's talk about his decoy positioning with a fence line situation. Uh, how would you run that? Well, yeah. So I'm, I'm liking everything you're saying, uh, cause I agree with you. If, if there's, if you've got sporadic activity around there, that means that they're around there and they're milling around there back and forth, back and forth. It's not like they show up at eight o'clock 
you know, 30 minutes after uh, after sunrise, they show up and then they're gone. And that's the only time you see them. Because then if that was the case, you're just going to pass through and they're going somewhere else. But if you have just, you know, mid-morning and just kind of pictures here, pictures there, pictures here, that means those birds are around that area and they're comfortable. So I agree with Jay. Stay right. I would not even crowd that roost. I would go over to where, you know, maybe a few hundred yards from the roost or where you think they're going to be hanging out for the day. And, yeah, I with that fence line, if, if they're walking along that fence line, how much is it, is it a narrow corridor? You know, the fence is here, and then is there a, a river or is there... You know, in other, in other words, is it wide open where the fence is, or do you have it's, some cover, right, Chris? Or a pinch? Or is it a pinch point? Pinch point. Yeah, is it a pinch point or open? Uh, from if you're if you're standing with your back to that fence line, I have an open pasture. Um, there is some disturbance. You know, there is like a gulch about 200 yards um, down. Uh, if you're going to the west of the property, I mean, you're going up a hill. But I have a good, gosh, I don't know. Um, 40 yards by 40 yard just kind of pasture that it's wide open okay. with, with tall grass but do you Perfect. have okay. cover Perfect. for your blind i actually yes i i put my blind up yesterday um or two days ago just to kind of get it acclimated there is some scrub oak uh kind of in the middle there that's just randomly positioned that i put my uh blind so that the scrub oak is behind it and then um, out to my left window of the blind, I've got the probably about thirty yards from me is where that fence line is. Perfect, perfect. Okay, that, that's money. Because all I was going to say is, if if you're if the fence line, the reason why if they were following that fence line because there's a pinch point there, what I was going to say is I would not put my decoys smack dab up against that fence and in their direct line of travel. I would prefer to have my decoys off that fence a little bit so that they have free access to move down that <clears> fence line yes. and can engage my decoys if they want. Exactly. Because that way you don't cause an alarm situation where they have no choice but to engage your decoys. I want to give them the opportunity to enter in, engage my decoys if they want. But if they don't, and say this is a small population, that it's a tight-knit group, and they're a little leery, they can keep walking right on by, and you can judge their behavior and, and adjust what you need to do from there if they decide to skirt you. But it sounds like you've got a perfect situation right there anyway, and it, I'm glad to hear that you put your blind up already. Let the birds get used to it. A lot of times you can throw a blind up and, and hunt turkeys regardless, but if you have the ability to put a blind up and let them get used to it, go for it. That's what I do out here. So that's awesome. I like the idea that you're 30 so yards off that fence line. I would have my decoys off that fence line. Um, that That's perfect, perfect scenario. The only other question I would say with your, other than what Jay just, asked, I mean, Jay nailed it, where, so your ground blind, how are the openings of your blind, what type of blind do you have, and how are the openings of your blind situated? Um, I've got that 360 surround view Primos blind. Okay. Um, I like it. I ended up putting the back wall on it because I thought it was getting too much light transmission through it. Excellent. Um, Excellent. So I set it up. Um, I actually, uh, you know, it has the little, um, you can either have like the sides that you raise up and down, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, and yep. then the other sides have the little shooting cutouts. I almost have it angled because I prefer to have um, one of the little uh, cutouts to have uh, my broadhead sticking out. Okay, perfect. You got so and and which? Well, I guess it doesn't matter with it with the surround view. I guess it doesn't matter as much. I was going to say, I you know, for those type of blinds, if you have the window, the the slide, the horizontal window open. The other consideration I was going to say is. If you were setting it up and the sun was shining in the morning, the sun was shining into it, you got to be careful. Make sure you have it so that the sun is not shining directly into the blind. With the surround view, that you don't have a choice. It, the sun's going to be it's coming in. So I'm glad to hear you have the back wall up there. But just understand, you, you know, it is what it is. So understand that also it's, if the birds dance around your decoys, is that shoot through window, that little cutout, is that going to be big enough for you to, to swing left or right? 
of your decoys in order to get a shot, or would it be better to slide that horizontal window open a little bit? Yeah, that's probably a good consideration. Um, depending on the decoy setup, I may be a little limited. It just gives you options. I know, and Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, I know you're, you have the Zenix line and I, I, how we set it up. I, I love the horizontal window design on any blind that I have. Um, just keep in mind, you don't need a gargantuan hole. Literally, if you think about from where your archery site and housing is in relation to where your arrow is at full draw, you're only talking about a couple inches. And so, literally, for my hunts, when I'm running my, I, I use those style blinds extensively. I say an opening no wider than nine inches. You don't have to have a big opening, okay? So, you don't have to let a lot of light in. So, for that surround view, that's kind of what I would probably use. I would go ahead and slide that wind, that horizontal window open, maybe no more than nine inches. A lot of times, for my personal hunts, I do six inches, but I'll have it nine inches. And I'll have it at least a cup, you know, left and right, maybe two to three feet or whatever the opening is in the blind, front of the blind. That way, if that bird, if the mature bird that you want to kill is a little timid and he decides to go strut five yards to the left or five yards or ten yards to the left or ten yards to the right of your, your decoy, you, you can just swing over and smack him. Justin, one question I have is what broadheads are you using and what are you planning to head shoot, neck shoot, or are you planning to body shoot? You know, in the past, I've always shot the, uh, gosh, forgive me if I'm wrong, is it the the Game Reapers? I'm not sure. It's the silver one with the blunt tip. Um, it's a uh, expandable. Okay. Uh, I did I did just sight in, um, fortunate to have 40 yards in my backyard here. I did sight in the Magnus Bullheads Good. Uh, this Excellent. morning, actually. Good. So I highly recommend, Chris and I just covered this, but highly recommend head and neck shots. Take your time. You know, it sounds like you've got a good little piece of property and you've got some time to hunt them. Go for that head and neck shot. It's either a clean miss or it's a dead kill. If you hit them anywhere in the neck or head, they're they're dead. Um, so I would encourage you, yes, do the Magnus bullheads and you know go for head and neck shot. And I think you're gonna I think you're gonna be sending us a picture of a big old tom turkey. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Any yeah. other questions? No, that's about it. Uh, got a probably a long two weeks ahead of me, itching <laughs> to get out there. Well, the good news is you've got a <laughs> trail you. camera working for you, um, you know, establishing patterns. And then, you know, the only thing I would say is be aware that if the pattern changes, be able to adapt. But, you know, it sounds like the perfect perfect plan. Give them a little space on the roost so your birds stay there. Even if you could almost hunt them, you know, day after day. As long as you let them roost there and you don't mess with them, uh, I think you'll be good. Actually, I just had a question pop in my head, if you don't mind yeah. me asking. Um, so the, the where the setup is, um, is almost like a hill in front of me. And where they roost is kind of, like I mentioned, back 150 yards. Um, they are running that fence line. Um, if they get into a couple days where I'm not seeing them running, um, having those decoys behind that hill, if I'm calling, say, in the morning with just some white chirps or some hen calls, um, is there any concern with those decoys not being visible if they're going to pitch down or should the calls themselves be enough to entice them? So Chris actually just talked about this. He actually likes the decoys not being in visual of the gobblers on the roost or the turkeys on the roost. He likes them to almost want to seek out what's making that sound. Um, you know, one thing that's coming into my mind too is, Yes, I think that with this with this strategy, I think having them where they have to kind of seek out, you know, the hen call and then go, oh, there, and then have confirmation that, okay, what we're hearing and now what we're seeing is, is a double confirmation that those are turkeys. I would not set the decoys out until literally right before you're going to go, go, go time uh, opening morning. Um, but also... Keep in mind, I don't think you want them to see the decoys from a long, long, long ways away. It's almost like you, 
uh, without seeing the terrain, you almost want them to come down. They're coming kind of that way because they normally always do. And then, oh, there's some turkey decoys, and boom, they go to them, if that makes sense. Chris, what are your thoughts about them seeing them from too far away? Um, I think sometimes can work against you if, if you have the right flock that maybe isn't as social. Exactly. No, I, you're absolutely right. And this allows you to just kind of test that group out and see exactly what they want, how aggressive they are, or how timid they are. Um, because, yeah, you can, and the other, yeah, you, you hit a couple things, Jay. Number one, I didn't even think about this, but it absolutely happens. And I, and I hear it all the time, and I'm glad you said it. Yeah, don't go set decoys prior to you actually physically hunting. Um, that will absolutely kill you. Um, because they'll get to, they'll get used to having the set. They'll they'll go and investigate them, and then realize they're fake, and then they're, you're done. So make sure you don't you just don't put decoys out there for you know to get pictures or whatever, unless you're actually physically going to kill something. Um, and then the other thing is, I want them to be don't don't you've got private land, you know these birds are there, they have been consistent. You shouldn't have any. Unless somebody trespass or predators come through or whatever, they should stay consistent. So, if the birds come in and they come over and they peek over the hill and they, and, you know, they come in and investigate your calls, they see the decoys, but then they kind of sit there, they strut a little bit, strut a little bit, and then the hens just keep on going, and that bird just turns and follows and goes with the hens. Don't worry about it; just stay put because it's it, it, early season. That gobbler may be like, "Well, who the heck? There's a group of where these guys come from?" But man the ladies I'm with are over here and, and I know these ladies and well, they're going to go away. Uh, I'm just going to follow them. And they may just walk with those hens. And then three hours later, like you just said that a lot of the activity seems to be midday and scattered. You might have them go off with the hens in the morning and quote unquote, ignore you only for them to swing right back around at 10, 11 o'clock and walk squarely into your setup and just kick the piss out of your decoys. So don't feel rushed. Make sure, just, just, I would play it low key. I'm always more conservative than I am aggressive, especially in this situation. Cause if you bump them and they move and they go off the property, well, you're out of luck. So just take your time, let the decoys work let your calling work and just evaluate. Don't pressure them too bad. And I like the idea that they, they aren't going to see you come. Make sure you get in there early enough to where they cannot see you coming into your blind in the dark in the morning. And make sure when you set your decoys out, you're quiet. But I like the fact that they're going to start moving your way when they stumble upon your setup. It, oftentimes, that's a much, much higher percentage play than trying to force it down their throats, especially when we're dealing with these small pockets of birds. And on the full strut decoy, I would use real feathers if you can yes use a real tail do fan do you have the ability to get a, a real tail fan i have a fly shop i might be able to dig some up <laughs> <laughs> there you go i would try and yeah, find please. a full fan you can actually order them online i think it's feathers.com um okay justin you and i fish together so um if you can't find them i can i can give you links to find a real tail fan and having a real tail fan on a strutter decoy works way better than the one that's supplied. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Okay. Awesome, man. Look forward to maybe fishing again this summer. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, and look forward to getting out there, and thank you for all the advice. Keep us posted on how Good it luck. goes. All right, thank you. All right. All right, yeah, you're all mine now, brother, because, yeah, I'm in the same boat. We, we probably ought to wrap this one up before we lose every other, you know, the other two listeners that you have on your podcast. But, um, no, dude, I, I, I think it's interesting because I am I, I'm literally from a shotgun standpoint, I am on the other side of the spectrum. I, if I was going to recommend a shotgun for somebody, I would say get a pump shotgun because they're easy to load. You most of the time are not going to jam them. They're easy to clean. You can load it's easy to clean. They are, they are quiet to operate. And, you know, we can have a discussion about a long barrel versus a short barrel. It, it all comes down to which one patterns the best for you. I, I like the idea. I like my short barrel shotgun for the very reason they started developing the short barrel shotgun was because if you need to, if you're sitting in some sort of cover 
and you need to swing, well, a long barrel is going to catch vegetation and other trees and stuff long before a short barrel will. So a short barrel gives you a little bit more maneuverability, but I would not go a short barrel at the expense of a good pattern. Right. So just, but, 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 but nowadays, most shotguns, if you're going to buy a shorter barrel with the chokes that you can get, and now we're talking about the ammunition that you can get, goodness gracious, I, I do, I, I think you can do really good with a shorter barrel. Uh, and I am not a fan of the ability unless you unless you are a, a unless you are experienced with that shotgun. I have seen too many times in one it's situation with a with a young lady, a youth hunter comes to mind, semi automatic shotgun. Bird comes in, we're coaching her through it, everything's going good. She pulls the trigger. Now, again, it was a close-range shot, so she pulls the trigger, and she, it, the, either the bird moved or she got excited, and only one or two pellets hit that bird in the head, and it just stunned him. And it was standing there, and it starts working, you know, starts walking in circles, and it's kind of it's out of the loop. Well, she got excited, next, and we're getting ready to talk her through the next shot. Boom! The, the shotgun goes off, and before we can even talk her through boom there's the other shot it's like okay hold on a minute if you're dealing with new hunters sometimes i've seen with a semi-automatic shotgun where the excitement starts to take control rather than cool calm calculated execution of your shot that's where a pump sometimes if you go bang and you miss and the bird walks out there a little bit at least for me, if I'm in a ground blind, I can reach over, grab the shotgun. I can quietly re-pump that. Uh, I can put another round in the chamber. Meanwhile, the bird's like, what is going on? You know, if, if they're working the spread and settled already, sometimes that bird can linger a little bit. I can actually hand that over to them. Now they've had the chance to calm down a little bit, and they can follow up and make a, a good executed second shot. So, no, I that's... I did not expect that. I, I thought we were going to be on the same page on that, but it's interesting that you brought it up because it's, it brings up a good compare and contrast because there are a lot of people that want a semi-automatic shotgun because of the quick follow-up ability. I used to come at from the standpoint of man, they jam. I, I've seen so many jam, you know, people that are not familiar with the gun, it ends up jamming. They, they, when we're trying to be quiet, they ride that slide down and it doesn't lock all the way in. So you get a, a misfire or you, the trigger's just not there. And in those, in, you know, exciting moments, sometimes all three of those shots go off before you, <laughs> you can even do anything about it. Now you got to reload anyway. Yeah, I oh. hear you. It's definitely, definitely something to debate and to question. I think we could go either way. Um, Wow, we've covered a lot of ground. I think this has been very yeah, good. Man. I think people get really good value. Um, Chris, I want to give you a chance to let listeners know how to follow along, and obviously I'll link it up in the show notes, and we're actually going to do a joint. Uh, we're going to both use this content, so I think it's going to be bo uh, great for both of us. It's always great having you on. It's always great talking turkeys, and I think this will be another extensive uh series uh that we've done on turkeys and and i encourage anyone else to listen to the other seven part series that we did on turkeys we've i've gotten tons and i know chris has tons and tons of feedback on that so i think we're going to get uh, more great feedback on this so chris how can people follow along and any last uh, thoughts you have yeah no it's always for for anybody that does it's just always row hunting resource roe hunting resources no matter where you are it's our website and you can go we've got an educational module there that you can learn a bunch of this stuff and see video of it talking about it um and i did i, I went ahead and i looked that video up and yeah it's under the the straight shot videos on my website as far as the turkey anatomy and the, and the shot placement um it, it's a good video to watch because it, it really opens that it, it it's very revealing on exactly where their heart and lungs are in relation to previously um, I previous, I guess I won't say dogma, but anyway, some of the old school thinking of where to aim on a turkey doesn't really match up to where their heart and lungs are. So that's in there. But if you go on social media, YouTube, it's always R O E 
row hunting resources and you can find me there but the other like you said i, I want to be able to share this with with our folks too and and i really do encourage if you especially now that we're sitting there you know supposed to be self-isolating and staying home and these movement orders and everything else people are just consuming stuff online if you are a passionate turkey hunter i've got a bunch of stuff on my youtube channel but it does not even compare to the amount of video turkey turkey video that jay has on his youtube channel so by all means jay where tell people where to go to see some of that stuff because they definitely need to follow you on social media because you post a lot of stuff there as well by all means give them your spiel because i think it's worth it yeah, I mean, the YouTube, they can just, uh, best way to find it is probably just J. Scott Gould's Turkey Hunting. And on my actual uh, YouTube channel, um, there's, I think, 175 Gould's Turkey videos. A lot of, you know, really good quality behavioral stuff, you know, just watching them in their, you know, doing their thing, beating up decoys and all of that. Uh, also, J. Scott on Instagram, jscottoutdoors.com. Uh, and, uh, Chris, it's always great, uh, having you on row hunting resources, a trusted, uh, valued source of, of most Western hunters that are serious. So I encourage my listeners go check out rowhuntingresources.com. Chris has the, the elk module and the turkey module, and it, it's, uh, it's a subscription, uh, video, but the amount of content, uh, in the subscription module is absolutely amazing and the instruction stuff that Chris does is second to none so Chris I want to hats off to you for all of the great work that you've done on that and it's always great kind of partnering and doing uh, things like this and trying to dive in the weeds and get real extensive and uh, I think we're pushing on five hours here uh, and there's, <laughs> there's not many people that you can just sit and talk and I mean we could probably go another five hours and still be going um, so it's awesome yeah. to, to talk to someone that's passionate, but, uh, even more someone that's got as much knowledge and background that you do. So, um, great job, buddy. Well, I, I appreciate that's Very generous. I appreciate it. I love you. And, and I, I do enjoy our conversation. So as always, you're welcome. If you, if you, anytime you want to chat, let's chat. But, uh, I, I, I've got a couple ideas for you that I'm going to pitch your way and we're going to have some more fun with this. So no, thank you very much for that. And I do, um, I fingers crossed brother. I, I really hope for all of us. Uh, I hope that this COVID-19 thing just kind of, I, I put on my social media, I, I kind of hope it just kind of wafts away like a spark in a ground blind. Um, <laughs> it just kind of just, just disappears, but you know, I really hope it doesn't interfere with the guys that want to come down and, and get their ghouls turkey with you. And um, I just hope it, I hope everybody stays safe, be smart, just stay healthy, but uh, don't let it get, don't, don't let it discourage you. Get out there and enjoy nature and, and good luck this spring. Right on buddy. God bless. Take care.